Welcome to Pals. It's Prosanyamu's Anatomy Lecture Series. In this place, our goal is to make anatomy simple. If you are just joining us, you have not subscribed, we would like you to please do and be a part of this amazing anatomy family. This is the third and the last part of our lecture on anatomy of the brachial plexus and it is actually on brachial plexus injuries and their clinical presentations. So let's go right on to class. What is brachial plexus injury? It is any injury involving damage of any of the components of brachial plexus, be it at the roots, trunks, divisions, or cords, or even their branches. And how do these injuries occur? They could occur as stretch injuries. They could occur when the nerves are compressed, when the nerves are torn, or in most serious cases, when the nerves are ripped from the spinal cord. So we start with looking at the major causes of brachial plexus injuries. So this can come as trauma. It could be traction or crush injuries. We can also have compressions at the superior thoracic aperture, which will lead to thoracic outlet syndrome. It can also be obstetric lesions during birth. Injuries could occur at various points of the brachial plexus. Then it could also come due to lesions following irritations and a number of other causes. Here we are seeing some of various causes. Here we are looking at trauma. In this place we are looking at inflammation. Here we are looking at causes such as cancer, tumors, and then this is a typical example of um, birth injuries or obstetric injuries. Now before we go to specific brachial plexus injuries, I want us to know the various um, type of nerve injuries. We're going to start from avulsion. Here is a case of avulsion. In avulsion, the nerve is torn away from its attachment to the spinal cord, as you can notice here. Now, another type of nerve injury is what is called rupture. In rupture, the nerve is torn, but not at the spinal cord attachment. And here is an example of rupture. There's, the nerve is torn here, but it is not from the its attachment to the spinal cord, as you can notice in this case of avulsion. Also, neuroma is one, one other type of nerve injury, which comes as a result of scar tissue growing around the injury site. When this happens, there's a pressure on that injured nerve. As you can also notice here, this is a case of neuroma on an injured area of the nerve. And we can also have the mildest form of this injury to the nerve, which is the neuropraxia. And here, this is neuropraxia. This is the mildest form and is just caused by transient compression or stretching of the nerve. Now, in our consideration of some of these brachial plexus injuries, we are going to do two things. We are going to consider injuries at the root, at the trunk, and then at the cords. And then what we we'll also look at will be the characteristics of these defects. We we'll start from looking at where is the site of the injury. In this injury, are there specific nerves that are involved? And when these injuries occur, what are the losses noted in terms of cutaneous loss and motor loss? And finally, are there deformities following these injuries? So these are the things we are going to consider. We are going to start with damage to the whole plexus. While this is rare, the site is mostly at the roots. So here, when we have a case of avulsion around the roots or damage, that involves all the root of brachial plexus. This results into total brachial plexus damage. What usually causes this? It will range from motorbike accident to landing on the shoulder and a number of other factors that could lead to avulsing of the 
root of brachial plexus. When this happens, there is complete motor loss to all muscles of the upper limb and also sensory loss to the entire upper limb. So what are the clinical features and presentation when this entire brachial plexus is injured? Number one, the whole limb is immobile and anesthetic. You can't feel anything, you can't move the, the whole entire limb. And then there could be presentation of Horner's syndrome, which can come as a result of the connection between the nerve root and the sympathetic trunk. There's that connection. And then if it's severed, there is a presentation of Horner's syndrome. Now, with this presentation, we'll be having the constriction of the pupils, as you can notice in the illustration we have here, the pupils are constricted, and then this is called meiosis. And also we see the drooping of the eyes, as you can see here, and then this condition is also called ptosis. And there are other conditions associated with this Horner's syndrome. Now we'll move from damage around the roots to damage to the trunks. We're going to start with the upper trunk. Damage to the upper trunk of the brachial plexus is called Epps palsy or Epps Duchin's palsy or Epps paralysis or upper trunk palsy or paralysis. This paralysis is the most common traction injury to the brachial plexus. So where does Epps palsy injury happen? It happens at the upper trunk, at the part of the upper trunk that is called Epps point. At this part of Epps point, we can see six nerves meet here. Look at these nerves, the C5, the C6, the subclavius, nerve to subclavius, the suprascapular nerve and the anterior and posterior divisions of the upper trunk. So at the point these six nerves meet is the point that is called Apes point. And injury at this point will lead to the clinical manifestations that is associated with Apes paralysis. So what could cause this injury? This injury happens when there is an excessive increase in the angle between the head and the shoulder. As you can notice in this illustration, there is an unnatural increase in the angle between the head and the shoulder. What this does is to put pressure on the upper trunk at the apes point and then there could be lesion at this point. How does this also happen? It can also come as a result of complicated or prolonged labor fall on the shoulder or some other causes. Now when Epps paralysis happen, which nerve roots are involved? Of course we know the two main nerve roots are involved in formation of the upper trunk and these are the C5 and C6. Which nerves are affected in this injury? Now we have suprascapular nerve, axillary nerve and musculocutaneous nerve and partly median nerve. So the nerves involved are suprascapular nerve, axillary, musculocutaneous, and partly median and radial nerves. If you're a fan of mnemonics also, I have something here for you, which I call Mr. Sam. So when these nerves are affected during Apes paralysis, it will also affect the functions of the muscles they innervate. So we're going to look at these muscles and then look at the activities that these muscles carry out. So see how it, how it runs. First, at the apes point, there is a damage. Now the nerves that pick their roots from these C5 C6 will also be affected. When these nerves are affected, the muscles the innervate will be affected. When the muscles are affected, the functions these muscles carry out will be affected. When the functions are affected, it will eventually lead to what is called disability 
or deformity. Now we're going to pick them at these various stages and then we'll be able to actually give step-by-step -step explanations of how the, these deformities or clinical manifestations can be explained based on our good knowledge of anatomy. Now we we'll start with the musculocutaneous nerve, which we said is affected in apes paralysis. What muscles do this nerve supply? We talked about the biceps and the brachialis. Now we also noted radial nerve. Radial nerve supplies brachioradialis, supinator alongside other muscles. We have axillary nerve and we noted that the axillary nerve supplies the deltoid and teres minor. For suprascapular nerve, we mentioned that it supplies the supraspinatus and infraspinatus. If you're still a fan of mnemonics, I actually have one for you too. And I coined this three brothers seats with deltoid. As much as grammatically the sentence is not correct by the three brothers and the singular seats, it will help us to remember the muscles that are affected, the three brothers, the biceps, the brachialis, and brachioradialis. Now, seats, the rotator cuff muscles, the subscapulary, infraspinatus, the teres minor, and the subscapularis. And finally, we have the deltoid. So, let's look at the rest of the actions that will be affected by these muscles. This slide shows us the normal functions of these muscles and also the lower section of the slide shows us motor loss and their presentation. We noted biceps brachii, which is a muscle supplied by a musculocutaneous nerve. What does biceps brachii do? It does flexion of the forearm it also is involved in supination of the forearm. Now we move to brachialis and brachioradialis. So these muscles are involved in flexion of the forearm. For supraspinatus and deltoid, these two muscles are involved in abduction of the forearm. For infraspinatus and teres minor, we know that these muscles are involved in lateral rotation. And then supinator is involved in supination of the forearm. By the time this, the nerves supplying these muscles are affected, the functions that are listed below will be affected. Now let's look at the lower part of this illustration. Now what will be the motor loss and their presentation? Deltoid and supraspinatus are affected and their function of abduction will be lost. So there will be loss of abduction as a result of loss of deltoid and supraspinatus. So what is the presentation? Because there is loss of abduction of the arm, the arm will remain adducted. Now for infraspinatus and teres minor, their function is lateral rotation. Because there is loss of lateral rotation, the arm will be medially rotated. Now, for brachialis, brachioradialis, and biceps, these muscles are muscles that are involved in flexion of the forearm. The forearm is going to remain extended. Biceps brachii and supinator are muscles that are involved in supination. This arm will remain pronated. What does this patient look like? This patient will present this classical presentation in Epps palsy. The arm is adducted and rotated medially. The forearm is extended and pronated and the deformity is called policeman's tip hand. As you can notice in the two illustrations we have for the man and for the baby. I also have a mnemonic for you which I called ampe. Now we'll look at the next damage to the trunk, this time not upper trunk, but the lower trunk. How can the lower trunk be damaged? It can be damaged as a result of excessive abduction of the arm. 
when this trunk is damaged, we call the paralysis clump case paralysis. So what's the start of this injury? We already said is the lower trunk. A number of things can lead to clump case paralysis. There could be undue abduction of the arm as in clutching a tree branch with a hand during a fall from a height. We can also have shoulder dystocia during a difficult delivery and the arm of the baby had to be put in such a way that there is undue abduction of the arm. There can be other causes such as the presence of cervical rib and then pancreas tumor. The branches affected here are basically two, the median nerve and the ulnar nerve, mainly the median nerve and then partly the ulnar nerve. Now, while we are not actually taking these nerves as a topic, to enable us to understand the deformity that follows this injury, we are going to present a summary of the muscle supplied by these two nerves so we can have a good understanding of how the deformities we will be presenting soon actually came about. So for median nerve, we have median nerve supplying most of the long flexor tendons of the hand and wrist and these are muscles that are coming from the forearm. These muscles are flexor capi radialis, palmaris longus, flexor turum superficialis, flexor turum profundus and flexor pollicis longus. We also have pronators of the forearm and we have these two pronators. We have the pronator teres and pronator quadratus. Also, other muscles supplied by the median nerve are the tenor muscles, abductor pollicis brevis, flexor pollicis brevis, and then opponent pollicis. The last muscle in this list will be the lumbrical muscles. The lumbrical muscles are, are muscles that will be emerging from the tendons of flexor digitorum profundus in the hand. The next list here is a list of muscles that are supplied by ulnar nerve. And we have the flexor capi ulnaris and part of flexor digitorum profundus. Also, the ulnar nerve supplies the hypotenar muscles. And we're here, we're having abductor digiti minimi, flexor digiti minimi, and opponent digiti minimi. We also have the medial two lumbricals. The ulnar nerve supplies the medial two lumbricals and also these two sets of muscles, the interosci muscles and the abductor pollicis. So quickly we are going to look at the muscles that are affected in the lower trunk palsy or clumcase palsy. The muscles are affected are those muscles that pick their origin from the hand and then the ulnar flexors of the wrist and finger. So what are those intrinsic muscles of the hand? We have two of them. So they are the lumbricals and the interosci. The next thing we need to do to appreciate the deformity that's associated with clump case paralysis is to know the functions of these muscles. Now the functions of these intrinsic muscles are one, flexion at the metacopophalangeal joint and two, extension of the interphalangeal joints. So here are some of the here are some of the lumbrical muscles and then here are the interosci muscles. We have the palmar interosci and we have the dosal interosci. Now what is the presentation in clump case paralysis? Let's take them, let's look at the loss of action and then the clinical presentation. Because there's a loss in the functions of those intrinsic muscles, the interosci and the lumbricals, there's going to be loss of flexion at metacarpophalangeal joint. Remember, these muscles flex the metacarpophalangeal joint. As a result, there's going to be a tension at the metacarpophalangeal joint. And this is as a result of the intact long extensor tendons of the hand and this operation is through the extensor expansion or the hood. Number two, 
there's going to be loss of extension at the interphalangeal joint and as a result the there will be flexion of the digits at both proximal interphalangeal joint and then the distal interphalangeal joint we have loss of ulnar flexors at the wrist and then let us appreciate this picture now here at this this is the metacarpophalangeal joint and we can notice that at this joint there is hyper extension here because we have lost the flexors now at this ip joint we can notice that these ip joints are flexed why because we have lost the extensors so the the hand takes up a disability which is called the complete claw hand this is the complete claw hand so the complete claw hand is a clinical presentation of clump case paralysis what are those presentations there is hyper extension at the metacarpophalangeal joint and then flexion at the interphalangeal joints there will also be loss of sensation along the medial side of the arm which are areas of uh, cutaneous innervation of the nerves that are involved just as we saw Horner's syndrome present during the complete loss of uh, the brachial plexus there may be presence of Horner's syndrome why because the T1 which is part of the lower trunk involved in clump case paralysis is also involved and is connected with the sympathetic fibers supplying the head and the neck so we notice those clinical presentations in Horner's syndrome that will include the ptosis, meiosis and hydrosis and the rest of the clinical uh, presentations in Horner's syndrome so Horner's syndrome will be present in two cases when there is a total loss of the entire brachial plexus and then in clump case paralysis now the last injury we'll be looking at in this brachial plexus injuries is axillary nerve injury this simply injures the axillary nerve and this can be caused by use of the crutches when the crutches begin to press into the axilla compressing the the nerves we can also have downward shoulder dislocations and also fractures of the surgical neck of the humerus these are some of the major causes of damage to the axillary nerve for us to understand the clinical presentation following damage to axillary nerve we will look at some of the muscles that are innervated by the axillary nerve number one of them is deltoid and we know that the deltoid is involved in abduction of the shoulder joint another muscle is teres minor and we know that teres minor is a lateral rotator of the shoulder we also recall that the axillary nerve gives sensory innervation to the lower half of the deltoid so what is the presentation now we we'll consider the motor loss first because deltoid is involved there's going to be inability to abduct the shoulder because that's what the deltoid does and because teres minor is involved there's going to be loss or weak lateral rotation of the elbow and then we're going to have some other little movement because there are some other lateral rotators that are not involved example the infraspinatus now for sensory loss there's going to be sensory loss in the skin at the lower part of the deltoid and this is the part that we refer to as the regiment's badge area and sometimes this sensory loss is called the regiment anesthesia when this happens for a long time we notice that suddenly the deltoid muscle which is the major muscle supplied by the axillary nerve will begin to waste when such waste comes it leads to a condition called deltoid atrophy as you can notice in this patient 
in this uh, illustration. This is where we will end this lecture on brachial flexors. Well, we are going to take other lectures on specific nerves like the radial nerve, we are going to do lectures on them, the median nerve, the ulnar nerve. So the clinical correlates we did are as they are related to the brachial plexus as a whole. If you have questions, comments or suggestions, please drop them in the comment section. And if you consider this material helpful, why not share them with your friends? We encourage you also to subscribe, like the video, and together we will build a unique anatomy family where we will keep making anatomy simple. Make sure I see you in my next video, but for now.